Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is John Kay. John has taught at Oxford, been Director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and the Side Business School, and in the past decade has concentrated his career on writing. As well as being a regular contributor to the FT, he's published a number of books, including The Truth About Markets, The Hare and the Tortoise, and The Long and the Short of It. His latest book, out this month, is called Obliquity, and explores the paradox that our goals, whether in business or in life, are more often achieved when pursued obliquely rather than head-on. I began the interview by suggesting that his younger self, who lived by economic models, would have been surprised by this championing of the oblique. Yes, that's true. I was brought up as an economist in the conventional way economists were. That is with the idea that people go around maximizing things. And economists, in a way, have invented an even better reason than that sounds for, than it sounds simply for doing that. Because they have argued that consistent behavior is the same as maximization. And in the mathematical sense, it is. And that was one of the issues which I needed to tackle in thinking about my, the book. The origins of the book, in that sense, come from my kind of experience of learning more about business, essentially. Mm. And as I did that, I came to realize that to say business is maximized profits was very facile as a description of what the complex institutions actually did. And being an economist, I went round asking myself, so if they didn't maximize profits, what did they maximize? And one day I realized, well, maybe they don't maximize anything. And it was a liberation to, to think that. And as it were, cleared a lot of baggage you know, out of my mind. And that was the origins for my mind of the, of the term obliquity. And it's where I've worked from ever since. And did the, the term obliquity, did the appositeness of that, did that sort of come on like a light bulb or did that sort of dawn rather gradually that that was what you were trying to describe? That, uh, that came from a different place and an interesting place, one, one that's actually very relevant to the theme of the book, which was it was a you know, conversation with Sir James Black and Black, as uh, you may know, is the man who won the, the no, uh, a Nobel Prize for chemistry for discovering two major groups of drugs for British pharmaceutical companies. Mm. One was the beta blockers, which he discovered while at ICI. They essentially were the making of ICI's pharmaceutical division. And then he moved to Smith Klein, and there he produced them and anti-ulcerant drug called Tegamet, mm. which was a blockbuster for that company, and actually a drug which imitated that called Zantac, which was created by, by Glaxo, mm. actually became at the time the best-selling drug in the whole history of the world pharmaceutical industry, and transformed Glaxo from a company with a, more, a small company with a rather uncertain future being Britain's largest and leading and the world leading pharmaceutical company. So Black, rather oddly, created more shareholder value for British companies than anyone in the history of British business. Now that's an important background because the term obliquity came up in a conversation I had with him where I was talking about his reasons for leaving ICI and he said that in a while ICI had actually, as I described in the book, invested a lot of money over over two decades in a way a company would not do now, but they'd invested a lot of money over two decades in establishing a pharmaceutical division and had lost money on it. And it was the sort of discovery of beta blockers that mm. gave them the first chance to make some. And Black was unhappy, in fact, because they wanted him to spend a lot of his time promoting the drug he discovered, whereas actually being a scientist, he wanted to get on and find new ones. And that was what prompted him to leave and go to Smith Klein, where, as we've said, he discovered, he made a major discovery for that company. And he said to me, I think of it as obliquity. I used to say to people in ICI, if you want to make a lot of money, there are easier ways to do it 
insisted on finding new drug. And then he stopped and said, you know, how wrong could I have been? I mean, you described the, the seeking of profit as the, the major motivation as being facile earlier. And in fact, you, you show that it can be much more than just facile. It can be dangerous and deleterious to the company if that is set up as the, as the governing objective. Yes, when I, said, when I said it was facile, what I meant was I realized that successful companies, you know, what made them tick was far more subtle than that. And indeed, too much focus on uh, profit motive actually destroyed a lot of the culture and character that made firms successful in the first place. Mm. And, and this was the paradox of ubiquity, the things that in the long run made them profitable. And actually, while I was thinking this through in the, in, in the late 90s for the first time, and saw a very striking example of that in Marks and Spencer, in a company which was you know, an iconic British business, which focused more under the kind of pressures that it was on under the in the shareholder value oriented nineties on its bottom line, as people called it then. And in nineteen ninety eight actually made a, a bill, reported a billion pounds of profit which is now the highest profit that, has ever, that company has mm. ever made because within the few months that followed, its sales started to fall off a cliff. You know, the iconic reputation it enjoyed with its customers had been eroded and it was never regained. Mm. You know, Marks & Spencer is now a perfectly well-managed, successful company, but it's no longer the business which it then was. Mm. No longer has the place in our corporate pantheon attended. In the book, you you speak out against what you call bogus quantifications and the sort of over reliance on on those econometric models that are, that I guess that early in your career you you produced. But <laughs> but you but you're not kind of arguing for a purely intuitive approach. No, so, absolutely not. While. You know, as you say, I spent a fair part of my career building and indeed selling, you know, these kind of models to corporations. And they're not without value, but they can have negative value if they're taken too seriously. Mm. That's one problem. But what I also came to realize was that an awful lot of what we were doing was, as it were, selling models to justify decisions that people had already made on other grounds mm. because people thought they ought to make decisions in that way even if they didn't. But you're right that uh, I, one of the big worries I have about this book is that people will, will say, so you're in favor of intuitive decision making and I'm not. Far from it. I'm in favor of highly rational thought through decision making and would like to think I still practice that myself. But that doesn't mean there isn't a huge role for emotion and judgment in decision-making. Emotion meaning that, you know, we get angry for a reason. We have mm. feelings of fairness and unfairness mm. for a reason. The, the feelings that we have that we can trust some people and can't trust others, you know, give us useful information. But we need to distinguish that from the kind of intuition that leads people to hear voices in the air or mm. know things that they can't know and don't know.